And welcome. Uh, my name is Hamid Shah, as Bob mentioned. I'm the director of the School of Journalism. And I'm going to be serving as the moderator for this panel titled Questions of Justice, Crime, Inequality, and News Media. Questions of racial justice have been front and center in the news in recent days and months. There's an ongoing debate about the racialization of the prison system, for example, the raci uh, racial e equity in the American courts. In cities around the country, uh, Chicago, Minneapolis, Cleveland, Ferguson, Baltimore, New York, Los Angeles, Madison, citizens have been debating issues surrounding race and policing. The difficult work that police departments do uh, to keep communities safe while trying to fairly and equitably enforce laws is often under public scrutiny as communities insist on accountability. Some police departments have undertaken careful and self-reflective reviews of procedures and policies in order to build trust and more effectively work with all members of the communities that they serve. In all of this, racial justice, crime, and, and a, uh, crime and inequality, police community collaborations is often the fodder for news coverage. And in fact, many of us learn about these issues through the news media. So it's vital that we think carefully about the role of journalism and journalists in questions of justice. Our panel of experts, I suspect, will have a few things to say about these, uh, these issues. So let me uh, move on to the introductions. Um, Matthew Brangan, uh, if you maybe raise your hand there, uh, is a local civil rights activist, a writer for Madison 365, and a member of the People Program staff at UW-Madison. He uses his privilege of being a mixed race individual to combat white supremacy and racism in sometimes difficult to access spaces. For Mr. Brangan, diversity isn't a plan or a goal, but a way of life in supporting the liberation of all those prevented from their humanity being fully recognized. Javed Kalim is the national race and justice correspondent at the Los Angeles Times. Before the Los Angeles Times, he worked for the Huffington Post as the senior religion reporter and as a religion and general assignment reporter for the Miami Herald. He's written extensively on the Roman Catholic Church, evangelical Christians, Mormonism, and Muslim Americans. Kalim was a, a senior fellow at the East-West Center uh, in Honolulu, I think, right? In 2014, and in 2013, he was a Henry Luce Fellow in Global Religion at the International Center for Journalists. Katie Culver has been uh, with the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at UW since 1999, first as a faculty associate, then as an assistant professor starting in 2012. She teaches courses on reporting, writing, and multimedia design, as well as media ethics and law in the digital age. She's the education curator for MediaShift, an innovative online platform focused on communication and digital technology. Culber's research focuses on ethics uh, and emerging media, especially on censors, brand, market, uh, brand publishing, and the public's role in establishing ethics and norms. And before her career in teaching and research, Professor Culver was the police reporter at the Milwaukee Sentinel and worked in digital marketing for UW Health. Michael Koval is the chief of police at the uh, Madison Police Department, where he began his career in 1983. He has spent his entire law enforcement career with uh, Madison Police Department, except for two years he spent working as a special agent for the FBI. During Chief Koval's tenure with the Madison Police Department, he has served in a variety of roles, including police officer, field training officer, field training supervisor, SWAT hostage negotiator, critical response team supervisor, primary legal instructor, and sergeant. Chief Koval is a graduate of the UW-Madison with a degree in journalism. 12-step recovery program. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. And he has a law degree from the William Mitchell College of Law in St. Paul, Minneapolis. So let me uh, kick off the session with a pretty broad question. 
to get our conversation started. And um, the question is, what are some of the major issues of concern for you as you think about the role of news media in covering questions of racial justice? And I'd like to start at the far end, if I could, Chief Koval, and uh, come uh, and have everyone else, others uh, respond. Sure. Well, obviously, my biggest concern is it applies to the local media treatment of issues of our, of our day here in the community, is that we're constrained by the medium of choice. You know, on any given 5, 6, or 10 o'clock newscast, whatever the case may be, depending on who the audience is and what their portal of getting information may be, it is so limited by the constructs of the medium that you can't possibly get into anything that doesn't create of a dichotomy of sort of polar extremes with nothing in the middle for consideration because there are these incredible time constraints. And quite frankly, with going back to my roots as a journalism student, as much as there may have been derivations of certain thematics from when I graduated, I'm still struck by the fact that at least in the local news industry, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. And so there's a pandering to only the most sensationalistic of those police issues of our day, typically those crimes against person uh, where there's gun violence or gangs or things like that. And as a result, I think then that to get into the substantive context of racial disparities or other issues that are certainly pregnant in our environment here and that have to have a deeper dive, if you will, we're always going to be constrained by those limitations unless we see, now I see that millennials have now outpaced the baby boomers, so perhaps the electronic mediums that people are getting their primary sources of information are less constricted by those um, time constraints. Uh, I, I would um, add on top of that or maybe extend or, or uh, shift a little bit from Mike's comments. Um, I, I think uh, story selection, uh, what, what we cover, um, and a lot, this is a lot that we've talked about today already, and for the angle from which we cover it or how we cover it, um, you know, uh, rioting versus rallying um, could be this, the same event in two different people's eyes. Uh, I think also, um, uh, the, the extent to which we cover uh, these issues ar around uh, race and, and justice, um, uh, which would relate to Mike's comment of a, lo a lot of um, kind of parachuting in and writing about uh, the big event of the day, um, and then reporters leave, and they forget about it on to the next thing. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> yeah, no. Um for me, there's no real disagreements with what's already been said. Um, and, and even re reaching back to early in the day, the, the idea of objectivity, uh, I feel is oftentimes as seen as giving equal space to both sides when that's not necessarily always the case. Um, that's, to me, that's not necessarily being objective. It's not following the evidence. Uh, it's not, you know, you, you gotta go where the evidence leads you. And if that leads you to a conclusion that is on, you know, opposite of what you feel or, or the other end of opinion of somebody else, that's where the evidence led you. Um, so you shouldn't give equal time or equal validity uh, to opposing viewpoints if one viewpoint, um, I mean, it's a little off topic, but I mean, I think clients, climate uh, changes is the perfect example of this is, you know, if we have 97% of our climate scientists saying um, one thing, why are we, you know, having on, you know, one person and that, that is a climate denier and one person that's a, a, you know, supports, you know, says there's global warming, um, arguing back and forth, um, like they're both equally valid. It, it, that's not the case. Um, that's, a, that's a big deal when it comes to, to particularly with racism and, and social justice. Uh, when we have a lot of qualitative and quantitative data telling us all these massive disparities uh, are existing. So when you give equal validity to somebody saying, well, this isn't actually the case, when we, we, we have the, the data, um, that tampers down on what actually is going on. That's not being objective. Um, and that leads into to really my second biggest thing, and that's and, uh, really almost the siloing of, of talk of, of, of justice and, and racism. Uh, we heard that a little bit when it's talked about with, with an education 
Um, we have these disparity numbers, but it's, you know, people throw their hands up. But then a lot of times when we talk about racial disparities within education, that's not tied to poverty, which isn't tied to incarceration rates, which isn't tied to concentrated poverty and crime rates. You know, all these things are, are webbed together. And when we don't talk about them really at, at the macro level and how they're connected and how they impact one another, we're, we're doing a disservice to what's actually going on um, and aren't actually presenting um, really the whole picture and almost something that, that ends up being not factual uh, because you don't see where they connect. So to pick up on a couple of those, um, I do think the concept of parachuting in is really troubling to me when it comes to matters of race and justice and that we tend to parachute in at the most difficult moments in people's lives and we report on these episodes of crime and yes, they tend to be the most sensational episodes. And when we do that, we ignore issues coverage. We you know, do not draw the bright line that needs to be drawn um, around um, matters of poverty and problems in education, joblessness. And that's not to say that I think that um, news organizations or individual journalists set out to get it wrong. I, I don't think they do. I think they set out to get it right. And when I reflect on my own career, um, it's a really troubling exercise for me because I looked at myself as a person to whom integrity was very important. I tried to make ethical decisions. I turned toward mentors. I, I really tried to make the right choices as much as I could. Um, you know, so I would focus on, you know, whether we should be naming rape victims, how young is too young um, for, an, uh, for an offender to be named. Uh, lots of really important questions, but they were micro questions. <laughs> they were individual, episodic, story-based questions. And um, at the risk of admitting my age, I will share that I was a police and justice reporter in Milwaukee and um, in um, Illinois. Um, long ago <laughs> and uh but and i was making these choices and and really really focused on on being ethical i now as i look back and reflect on that time realize that i was a police and courts reporter at the very time that the mass incarceration movement happened in this country and when it and with a remarkably failed drug policy was really taking hold in this country when we began to imprison black men at unprecedented rates. And mind you, I worked here in Wisconsin, which is ground zero in that, in that um, I'll use the word, tragedy. And I didn't report on that. I mean, I can remember one or two stories questioning the drug war, um, but I was so busy covering this homicide or that warehouse fire or a set of drunk drivers in the police blotter, um, that I missed the macro. And that's my big concern in journalism ethics, in a lot of different fields, but particularly in this field, that we really failed to inform our communities. Um, and in part, I think that's because I was removed from those communities. I was too distant. I did not, in trying to be objective, I didn't get in close um, with people who were having a completely different experience. And, I, and I, it, it's just it's tough to think about that. Something that, and on top of that, that I, um, that I really build on your distance. And I think we see that particularly here in Madison a lot. Um, and I don't think Madison is, is really any special in that means. And we have a lot of people um, that write about what's going on in Madison that aren't actually in the communities, don't actually go in and, and talk to our multiple Madison black communities because we're so siloed out, aren't actually really going in and talking to the students. They're sitting from afar and, and um, might be seeing comments from, from Facebook and Twitter but aren't going in and say, well, what do you mean by that? What, is, what does this mean? Um, I mean, really anything, if you know, recently a, a young student was arrested um, for anti-racist graffiti. Um, and a lot of the, the, the articles that I've seen written, they don't really talk to him about, well, what do you mean um, white supremacy is, is in the air, it's the air we breathe? Well, what does that mean? Uh, what did he mean by that? And what was, this, you know, what was the impact of that? Um, it's just like that, that was there. Um, and that's important to know, the, 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 the context behind it, why he was doing that. Um, and then even to go further is, is, is this idea that, uh, we've talked about, that I've talked about and, and some of my colleagues have talked about is this idea of, uh, uh, well actually King called it a derivative crime. Uh, we, we like to say crimes of poverty, but this, these are 
crimes that happen um, because of a much larger crime. Um, King would, would talk about uh, crimes within, in, in black communities across the country or in response to the riots as being derivative crimes to the larger crimes of white society and implying that these crimes wouldn't be going on without the larger crimes going, uh, happening um, brought upon by white society. Um, and we see that with, with you know, King Shabazz and this, this mentality of how he's responding, how he's going out. Um, yes, it was a criminal act, um, but the, the why um, these things are happening oftentimes just isn't answered. It's just this is what happened um, and the why is important. I would just add on top of that, so kind of what, one thing I'm kind of thinking about as I hear this conversation is um, in the background is kind of the, the economy of, of news and journalism right now. Um, I've worked for a traditional newspaper, I've worked for an online uh, churning out kind of monster website, uh, and I've worked for another newspaper now. Um, and we're all kind of, you know, crunched. And so, uh, uh, but as journalists, we, we do need to slow down sometimes. and. Um, not always trying to try to be on the next story, but pause and go into communities, go into places and go meet people without an intention of anything but getting to know them and hearing what they have to say and letting them dictate what we cover. Well, um, here, here. <laughs> I don't have a mic. Yeah, I'd share. No, it's okay. So it, very interesting comments, and I just want to kind of focus in on a couple of um, concepts that, that were thrown out here, um, sensationalism, story selection, siloing, um, parachuting episodes. Uh, it's, uh, what I'd like to ask you to respond to is the idea of how can we make or move beyond kind of event-based spot news coverage? Because institutional racism, structural racism, these are processes, they're not events. So how do you make journalism, uh, how do you make uh, those kinds of things newsworthy uh, in, given the context, the, uh, the economic context that Jeb had talked about as well? So how do you, how do, you do that? I don't know how you make it newsworthy. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that, like, that's really dependent on, you know, a lot of it is part of economic structure. Um, you know, these are for-profit industries. Um, much of them are for-profit for industries, um, and, and that, that's a problem. Um, so if, if people aren't, you know, something might be so-called newsworthy, but people aren't reading it, then it's not newsworthy. Um, but I'm going to speak really from a, a personal level on, on what I do, and, you know, I, I wouldn't call myself a journalist, but more of a writer um, in my writing for Madison 365. Um, but I try and tell a narrative um, and connect things um, from, from the micro to the macro. Um, from a specific incident, specifically what's going on, to historical context, um, to we're really ongoing context um, in, in, in American history, in a larger American history, and to show that these, what might seemingly be from the surface isolated incidents or, or acts of an individual are really acts of a, or habits of a larger society at hand, um, and, and to really bring that out and point that out. Um, and to draw those connections. Um, so it's, it, it's more than just talking about this one incident. It's, it's really um, pulling out from the micro um, into the macro. So one thing that I would say, I mean, I, I really appreciate the point that newsrooms are strained. I mean, we've, we've lost tens of thousands of jobs over the last two decades, and that, and that does make all of this much more difficult. But Hamid, I think what you're really the, the real cause of this is actually one of the biggest, one, maybe the biggest countervailing pressure that, that counteracts ethical practice, and that's competition. It's the, you know, is Channel 3 really not going to cover um, the arrest of a, a student who did graffiti when they know that their competing stations are going to cover it? Um, that, that competition is a really, really big factor. It takes a sustained commitment by a news organization to look into these sorts of issues. I, um, I would point to, um, not, it doesn't deal with race, but um, the Gannett Wisconsin Media recent effort to um, dig into why Wisconsin has such a disastrous, uh, disastrously high teen suicide rate. And they have invested a great deal um, into teen mental health, and they've done it with some really interesting, you know, they, they took a side. They took a side and they said, this is wrong. 
It is wrong that we are, you know, people were saying before, I'm, I'm against murder, I am against slavery. Um, we have to say, I am against a, a society that's divided on race. I am against the disparities in our educational system. I have a problem with the mass incarceration in Wisconsin. And by the way, you can hit all sorts of people with that story, because in part it's a human story, but it's also an economic story. You know, those of you sitting around here very upset about defunding of the University of Wisconsin, that money went in large part to incarceration in the state. So I think there are ways to tell that story compellingly, but it requires organizations to be committed to telling it. I, I would um, uh, also add, you know, to extend my previous comment on the economics, um, you know. <laughs> Is this back now? Okay. You're, you're back. <laughs> uh, how, do we make, how do we make people care about the, the, the big things happening, uh, how this is all interconnected when it's, and not just individual events or crimes? Um, and I was going to say back to the economics comment that I made. Uh, I guess this is back. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, uh, news organizations, um, all of them are in turmoil. Um, the big established brands, the new media brands, all, all of us. Um, we're still doing good work, but it's a struggle because everyone's trying to figure out uh, how to, to, uh, to survive, um, which goes back to uh, you know, the convincing news companies and reporters and editors to, to look at the bigger structural issues going on and how, how racism is connected to poverty, to uh, education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that presents an opportunity as well. Um, everyone's looking for the, the, the solution, the fix. What's the, what can we cover, what can we do that will, will make us succeed as a business? And step right in, I mean, and, and, and say, let's cover race, let's cover justice very seriously and, and, and in a big, impactful way. Um, that's what happened where I work at the LA Times. They laid off, or they actually had buyouts for 80 people, and then they just said, said we're gonna hire 40 people in their place in different jobs that we think we have to cover. Um, that we haven't been covering before. And that's how I am where I am right now. Just to add from a local perspective as well, we have just seen, owing to the economy of scale that you were referring to, the diminishing advertising dollars and uh, newsroom staff, it seems like we're getting a new face. There is no one central person now that covers cops. And I think at times there's this uh, overreach that well, this has to be resolved, this highly complex issue, as Matthew talked about, where you've got literally the educational and economic and all these other housing things that are seamlessly interwoven, and they want a resolution in two and a half minutes. And that's problematic, of course. And the other thing is, is that I literally got to the point where I was so wondering about the randomness of the selection that I asked one of the newsroom directors, what is your algorithm for what you decide to lead with and cover in the news locally? And very plainly, matter of fact, he says, uh, if the story would appeal to a 32-year-old soccer mom, we're all over it. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I don't know that that appeals to as many people in terms of difficult issues that you have to drill down on when you're dealing with issues of race. So the one thing that I would say, though, is that owing to the fact that I have two sons that uh, in their 20s, what I, I was explaining sort of the same conundrum. A while back, uh, one of the more interesting, for me, difficult decisions to make was we were approached by The Daily Show to do a piece on implicit or unconscious bias. And I must have agonized on 
pulling the trigger on that for a full two days because in the middle of the volatility of the environment in which I was working in, I was very concerned because I knew from my adult sons that, you know, I actually tuned in once, I'm, it's past my bedtime, that the, uh, <laughs> the parody is, is the medium in which they introduce difficult conversations. And so I asked these guys in their 20s, I said, well, what, are your, what is your take on this, guys? I don't want to appear to be disrespectful and glib about a subject which I do feel should be to the forefront in discussions about who we hire and how we train. And they said, Dad, I think you really ought to go for it because I think this has a wide reach and they do it in a way that can be tastefully done while also maintaining sort of that entertainment vibe. And I'm glad we did it. Uh, you know, again, they had some parody with it, but I do think, if nothing else, it began in some circles of the country a discussion that heretofore had never been broached. So the way in which these difficult issues are approached to me has some significance as well. And by the way, it's interesting. I always know when there's going to be an attempt at getting something more comprehensive. It's almost as if when they come in and they spend more than two minutes, I can literally turn to the reporter and say, are we coming up on sweeps weeks? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, yeah, how'd you know? I said, uh, just a clue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I also, one, one other point is that I think um, the structural question within newsrooms is how we define these positions, these beats. I mean, defining something as a police reporter, so you are the police reporter, um, sets up, it, it, it lays a foundation and, and it says, okay, you're the police reporter, so you go to Mike, because he's the police and he's, he's your source, and then you begin to have this deference to official sources, you're not out in the community. What a different um, orientation we'd have if they, we had less of that kind of structure and more, you know, you are now a poverty reporter. Wow, that would be a completely different way of going at very much the same kinds of stories. One of the things I'm noticing here is the, the reference to depth in your in coverage and the lack of depth, I guess. Uh, and so um, uh, I'd like to ask about how does one develop that kind of depth. And I want to ask in a very specific way. How, does, how do you think the race of a reporter factors in to reporting on communities of color in a way that we might consider characterized as in-depth in coverage? Anyone want to tackle that one? <laughs> Well, I will say we probably don't have as much experience with that here, given the unbearable whiteness of our newsrooms in this town. But um, I think, and I think we're going to, I'm just going to do a little foreshadowing for our last panel here. I absolutely think diversity within the ranks of reporters and editors is important. I, I, absolutely. That is not the only solution. If you are not going to have reporters across all of these different content areas getting out into communities that are not currently um, represented and building that trust and understanding new perspectives, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's ultimately, it says, it, 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 it puts all the onus on, on non-white reporters. Like, oh, you, you, we're going to diversify our newsroom and you're going to come in and you're going to solve the problem. Which means that, you know, Nico Savage over there is off the hook. He doesn't have to think about those sorts of things. I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. I think it's all of our responsibility. And, and you know, we hit on something in a couple of different ways previously, and that is it is a problematic orientation for a news organization to say it is serving its audience. No, <laughs> you are serving the citizens of your community. And if they are not picking up your newspaper or they're not clicking on to your Live at Five show, um, A, I want to know why you're not trying to capture that audience because they, they, they're money for you. Uh, but B, you're not doing what journalism is supposed to do. We're not here just to serve our readers. We're here to serve the citizens of our communities. And I'm sure there are some editors and publishers in the room, and news directors who are looking at me going, oh my god, there she is on her little academic high horse. But, but if journalism is not about that, I don't know what it's about. If, it, if we're limiting it to the narrow 32-year-old soccer mom, well, golly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's, all that is really important. You, you definitely have to have a, a, a diverse newsroom, but also have the, 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 give the freedom um, people of color to, to really tell stories and tell their stories and tell it from, from their point of view at the same time, yeah, you can't parachute and you have to build that trust and you have to 
let the communities you're talking about also tell their stories. You have to let what's going on there come through. Um, again, not sit back at a distance. It doesn't matter what color you are. There's a saying, and this can be applied to m multiple different things. Um, you can be skin folk, but not kin folk. I mean, you can look like you know me or, or whoever, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're representing that. And you can be so removed from the realities or lived experiences of, of a lot of people um, that you're not reflecting the lived experiences of, of so many of those people. Um, so it's, it's really important that you are reflecting those uh, lived stories, those lived experiences, um, and bringing that back around. Um, and you know, all the diversity in the world isn't gonna do anything if you're not able to actually tell uh, the lived stories. You know, every journalist, um, uh, uh, regardless of what they tell you, writes about what they find interesting and important. Um, what excites them, and, and they draw from their own experience and who they are in, in that selection, whether they know it or not. Um, so in that regard, uh, diversity and, ha and having non-white journalists and editors and uh, publishers and CEOs who are directing this kind of, uh, directing what choices are made um, will result in, in more in-depth and better coverage of race. Um, uh, that said, it's, I, I think Matthew is a, a, that phrase is very important, skinfolk but not kinfolk. Um, another thing uh, that was mentioned earlier today by Nicole on a previous panel was, um, you know, th there's not one black community, there's many black communities. And you have to keep that in mind for all, all races and groups of people of any kind. Um, uh, I'll give an example from my previous um, job as a religion reporter. Religion is not race, they're very different things. Uh, you can change religions. Um, changing race while they've seen some in the news is, is not really a thing. Um, but, uh, you know, as a religion reporter, um, I had certain access and, uh, to uh, Muslim communities and, and uh, South Asian communities uh, very easily and, and, and in really helpful ways um, because of my own background. But I, I also, there was also an assumption sometimes that I was, I was uh, uh, there to, to uh, positively cover certain groups and people, that, I, that I, there was a certain unspoken language or certain assumptions about what I knew about someone's faith or background or, or culture. Um, and I found it much easier um, and more productive as a reporter to cover Christians and evangelicals um, and uh, non-Muslims and non-South Asians because I could go in with a blank slate and just listen and ask questions and, and you know, have people assume I know nothing. Um, so one of the things that comes out here is that letting people tell their stories. I, so it raises the question about citizen journalism. Um, what, what do you all feel is the role of citizen journalism? Is it a, is it a valid form of reporting and writing? And, uh, what uh, kinds of interactions ought citizen journalists have with, with um, institutionalized institutional media or mainstream media, as some people like to call them? Um, I think citizen journalists play a really important role, especially in uh, today's age with everything with social media. Um, I mean, Michael Brown, the reason why we know his name um, is because of Twitter, because of citizen journalists who were there on the ground. Uh, tweeting out what was going on, um, and and that's important. Oftentimes, these citizen journalists are going to be the first ones there. They're also going to be the ones that live in these communities, the ones that know people, um, and can have access that people parachuting in don't. Um, they have that trust. Um, they might also provide a, a different view than the the so-called official view, um, which is again important uh, to have because. You know, the, what we're getting from you know, officials isn't necessarily going to be the truth. Um, and we've seen that with Walter Scott and Freddie Gray, and we have to take that into account. So providing that different perspective, that community perspective, these citizen journalists can help provide that. And then also provide really the context of what might be going on, um, whether there are you know, tensions um, uh, with really anything going on or things that are going on in the community can really provide a lot of that context. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to, to have more of the mainstream uh, news sources and journalists really at, at times open up and give up that space um, to have citizen journalists be able to, to tell the stories of, of their communities and, and the people around them. 
Katie or Javid? Mike? Um, I, I mean, I, I, go ahead, Mike. Well, I just think they have arrived. This is the new normal. The citizen journalist, for me, is part and parcel of the landscape now. Um, I know Matthew's on some committees at the city, some of which are looking at the notion of the body-worn cameras and what will or won't they bring in terms of transparency and ready accountability. I pretty much told my officers, we're already there in terms of the body-worn cameras. You're the only ones that don't have one. So you might as well just assume that that's there because I suspect that that is going to be increasingly relied on, much as if we'd almost see stringers back in the old day that would submit pieces for consideration. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even call them citizen journalists, just citizens. Right. Um, I mean, uh, I, I am so glad and happy that, that it's not just people like us in control anymore. Um, now, you know, uh, uh, journalists uh, with big companies, we have big platforms and um, money and resources to, to uh, take on uh, these bigger endeavors and investigations and such, but, but we'd be lost uh, without the people who, who really are the ones who are on the ground and impacted and, and part of these communities we're supposed to cover. Um, and I, I, I look to, um, I mean, I think one thing was mentioned about social media, I, I look to people on social media all the time for, for uh, uh, some sort of insight into to which directions I can go in my reporting. I, don't get me wrong, I think it is absolutely essential that citizens have that voice. I think it has um, challenged news media in very positive ways. But the main concern I have is um, that we look at social media with, uh, with too much of a magic wand effect. And I think about a lot of stories involving race and justice that are never going to be hashtagged. They don't show up. Um, you know, the, the really difficult story of the experience of um, a Latino dairy farm worker in Wisconsin. You know, he's not tweeting. He's not tweeting about the fear that rises when the latest bit of legislation gets introduced and, and you know, now worries about even getting in his car. So there are still those very, very difficult stories um, where people don't feel they have voice. They, they don't, they can't take their message out to the world. You know, slaves on an island peeling shrimp. Um, that's where the traditional news media still have to feel that obligation to tell those kinds of stories and to bring those kinds of issues to light and to do it in a way that people are, that make people care. Anyone want to weigh in? Anyone else? Yeah? No? I thought this was a really provocative question, actually. <laughs> it is a really provocative question. Well, I, okay, I'll, at the risk of talking too much, which everybody who knows me knows I do too much. Anyway, uh, I will say, <coughs> sorry, one of the problems with social media um, is sort of, it, it reinforces the episodic coverage um, in that you get this kind of social media rage of the day. And you know, uh, so now we're all fixated on this instead of fixated on uh, larger questions. So, um, you know, yes, it's important to cover um, the Black Lives Matter protest on campus. But if we're not then digging in longer term um, into the really tough issues, it it can gloss over things that are much more important, much deeper. He said, yeah. yeah. Oh, he said, yeah. yeah. No, I'm 100% cool. agreeing with that. I mean, that's, for, that's just real. And then, I mean, yeah, just to build on top of that, it, it, things move fast, but it is important. Um, I think that is, you know, that, that can absolutely be, you know, the role. And I, I do see that as role as, as far as the larger media groups in, in making that, that digging and, and to go in and to really explore, you know, why, um, let's say, why, you know, these, these protests are, are, are erupting on campuses and, and what the climate has been like that, that has caused. Um, the environment has, has been like to, to cause this to happen. What's the historical context to this too? I mean, UW Madison has had a long history of, of racism on its campus, um, and a long history of, of, of students saying this, this administration needs to do better. Um, so then, you know, citizen journalists are going to, oftentimes, it, you know, here on campus, they're going to be students that are talking about their individual experience and what's going on right now. Um, but then it'd be, I see, it's up to really more of the mainstream to, to, to grab onto that and to say, okay, where does this fit into the larger context of this university and racism on this campus? How do, how do these stories in 2016 fit into something that's been ongoing 
uh, on this campus since it's existed. Um, and where do we go from here? That's, no. So let me ask a sort of a different question. There's at least two people on the panel who are sources often. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Matt and, and Mike in particular. What is it like from your perspective to be interviewed by journalists on questions of justice, uh, crime, inequality, and so forth? And, and of course, Katie and Javed, you could also weigh in um, as well. Um, you, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Oh. It's interesting, um, and, and, and I mean, it's, it's like I've been interviewed by m multiple different people that have different racial backgrounds and also different understanding of, of, of racism, and you know, it's, it's, I can absolutely tell, um, you know, off whatever the first question might be, you know, the understanding of, of racism and white supremacy by this person, um, and, and, and what they're asking and what they're looking for. Um, it's... I mean, it's such a broad range of experiences. I, I, I really don't know how to describe it. it it's, it's hard because you, you try to think about it knowing. I know, like, you know, it's got to be, you know, these sound bites or, or these quick, you know, two lines. And so I end up saying a lot of different things that, you know, end up being one-liners uh, to try to give something that, that, that can fits into it to what I'm trying to say, uh, which I don't like. Um, I am also a, a big talker. Um, in writing for Mass in 365, one of the editors, Dave Dimer, is always like, well, you know, can you, can you cut you know, a few hundred words out of this? I'm like, but it's important. Um, and it's just like, all this stuff to me is just so important. I, I don't like to, to, to waste words. I love giving historical context and, and bringing that larger context to things um, and, and feeling that restrictions to, to try and boil something down into a soundbite I'm doing a disservice to the people I'm working with. I'm doing a disservice to, to, to what I'm trying to do. But at the same time, again, I have to know, well, this story needs to get out. What I, you know, where I come from is, is a, a viewpoint that needs to be said. Um, and, and oftentimes it's, it's quite frustrating uh, to, to be interviewed, especially when I'm being interviewed by somebody that I know is not going to provide a larger context to what's going on, is not going to provide, you know, talk about how 75% of our black kids here in Madison are in poverty, aren't going to talk about, um, you know, the history of racism in, in, in Wisconsin and, and how it's tied into certain federal policies and housing practices and, and so on and so forth and how our uh, uh, multiple black communities in Madison, Madison is ridiculously segregated uh, within its black communities, it's siloed out and that was done on purpose. Uh, so when we're talking about these things, that, that's not going to be brought up, it, that this whole context of why Madison or why this country is the way it is and how that led to this particular point on why we are talking about it is not there. And, and to me, that's very, very, very important uh, to have. Otherwise, you're not actually understanding what's going on. Matthew, they always find the wrong line of mind to you, so I can always oh, appreciate, <laughs> I can appreciate your position. Uh, that's what happens when you work without notes. Any event, I really do think it's driven by the medium you're working in. I have found that the, the questions of the print media, there's less um, inhibiting. They're more willing to listen, particularly if they're doing a serial piece over an investigative report over a Sunday or a series of work. And I, I obviously feel that the, the electronic media, the stuff that we see in local news, tends to be completely predictable and you almost know what the sound bite will be before you see it on the news. So I think it's so dependent. If you have someone who's a freelance journalist who has not the same time constructs uh, and they have the opportunity to get more probative in what you're talking about, I actually enjoy those interviews a lot more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love radio. Like, I love yeah, having that conversation. And, yeah. and that's probably my like, favorite thing is being able to go on to just WRT for an hour and have a conversation. Um, that's my favorite thing to do. I, I, I love having that. And then, yeah, absolutely, print media is, is great as well. And then having those, those interviews that, again, you, you get to have that, that back and forth and that conversation that can build on top of one another. Trying to fit something into the 5 or 6 o'clock news is not fun at all. I find that when I interview people, I, I often, um, I mean, I, as, as a reporter, you, you do some of your research beforehand, hopefully, um, and, uh, but I, I often uh, schedule more, more time than I need for my own questions. I, I, I schedule in a half an hour, an hour beforehand to kind of um, 
let the person who I'm talking to uh, air their grievances or, or talk about what they want to talk about and get to know me or back and forth a little bit before we get to uh, those certain questions that I, I really came there really, really wanting to know about. Um, because uh, as uh, Matthew said, and as Mike said, um, you know, uh, sometimes journalists just want, you know, your five letter answer um, and that's it. Uh, and, and, and you might be their only uh, chance as a reporter to really even speak to somebody in the media. So I, I, I like to work in a lot of time when I can. And that'll hopefully lead me to different stories and change my idea of what the story will be. Um, or maybe it won't, but I, I, I leave it very open-ended. I also think it's important to remember how journalists make their way to sources other than Mike. <laughs> you know, how do we how do we find people to inform these stories? I mean, you know, the disastrous statistic that in Milwaukee County, I hope you find this as breathtaking as I do, in Milwaukee County, for 30 and 40 year old black men, somewhere approaching half of them have been incarcerated in the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. Half. This is, that's a newsworthy story in and of itself. Yes, I could go to a sociologist here on campus, which is good. I think, I think improving the amount that we use academic expertise in our stories, like Nicole was talking about earlier, I think that's great. But how do we find our way to the series of mothers who have been forced into single parent households because of that incarceration. What does it mean to have that conversation? How do you build trust with those people to illuminate that story? Because when you tell the story in statistics, people are not going to, um, are not gonna care as much as when you tell the story in people. So Mike, I'm betting, and Matthew, I'm betting, are pretty good at about two to three minutes before the interview, running through their head, what are the three things I really wanna hit and how might I structure that sentence? That's not how people who really tell the human side of these stories of crime and justice and race, they, they, don't, they don't have that experience, they don't have that. Mike's easy to go to, Matthew's easy to go to. We have to go to the hard interviews and think about the effect of that interview with, for those sources. Why isn't that happening, Katie? It's, it's not happening because it's hard. It's not happening because we have staff that are cut. It's not happening because it really, if on, the, on the six o'clock news on channel three tonight, they've got two minutes to do a story and they're not going to be investing their time in, in starting those conversations. That doesn't mean they shouldn't, um, but it's competition that's that countervailing force. It's, it's a tough one. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quick kind of thing with that is, um, and then you're just covering of, of what's been going on on campus. There's a lot of times the interviews would be with the, you know, people leading it or somebody on the sidelines. Um, but something that I wrote about is, the only reason why I know about this is there's a, there's a among nursing student here that um, nobody in her class would partner with her. She went to her teacher, to her instructor. The instructor didn't do anything. She went to the head of her department. The head of her department did nothing. Um, she had nowhere to go. She didn't know where to go and what to do. Um, so when, when, you know, writing about, say, the real UW and racism on campus, that's a, you know, that's a story, that's something that you have to dig in deep for. That's not something that you can file a hate and, and bias report for. It's not explicit. So those stories that every day that, that something that's not, again, sexy, um, it, that's hard to get to. Um, and there's stories like that all over the place, that real human stories is, is tough and you have to dig through and ask around. So I'm looking at Jason over there and thinking what is going through his mind right now is, all right, how do I find that Hmong nursing student? How do I get to her? You know, I mean, okay. <laughs> Can I say something? You just, you, you just pull the not all. Um, and and he, here's a little thing. Forget the not all. If you're, not, if you're doing something like this, then you're doing something like this. But in, 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 it's oftentimes something that I get into to my writing when I, I talk about white people and platitudes. Um, you know, but at the same time, I, I hate the not all. Uh, because there's general forms of, of behavior and what's going on. Of, of course, there's always exceptions to the rule, exceptions and outliers. Um, you can't point to the outlier and say something's not a trend. Um, because if you have everything going in this trend, don't point to the outlier. Like that, that's an outlier for a reason. 
And so we have to, you know, understand that it's, it's an outlier. Um, and, you know, I respect it when, when I do see coverages and stories that, that do this, and it always surprises me. Um, I, I don't get most of my news from, from TV. I don't even have cable. I hate watching news on TV. It is the worst thing in the world. Um, I always want to break my TV if, if, if I'm watching it. Um, <laughs> I, I can't stand it. I, I dig through and, and read as much as I can. Um, but it's so many times, I don't know how many times I see it's like they could have gone that extra step. They, they, they could have you know, dug deeper and they, they could have connected it here and there. In so many ways, of course, there's going to be things I'm missing out on. Um, for every one good story I read, there's going to be 10 mediocre ones that could have taken that extra step. They weren't bad, but, you know, take that extra step. So I really, I hate the phrase, the media never cover, because they do, <laughs> you know. So I actually was having this argument with a faculty member saying the media never cover this particular issue about our current, um, our current situation with UW system. And <laughs> Pulled up a little link to a story. I said, here, here they are covering it. Uh, so it is, I think you're right, very easy to paint with that broad brush. I also think it is very easy to underestimate the really difficult challenges of doing daily journalism. I started out saying, I really tried to do good things as a reporter. I worked really hard and I had the right intentions and I still messed up. So I think that's, you know, that's one of the this is one of the things I don't know that people in the public appreciate um, about this field, is how hard it is to do, and also how many people really try to do it right. So, you know, it's very easy to say, yeah, they come in with the story predetermined and they're only getting a, um, a fast sound bite. Well, I just don't know many people who go into journalism because they want to do it badly. I think I know a lot of people who feel constrained and pressured, and I know a lot of people who don't have a sufficient range of perspectives, um, who, you know, who did not um, grow up going to integrated schools, who have not faced an arrest within their family, who maybe actually don't even know someone who struggles with addiction. And so their perspective is limited. What I'm saying is I think it's an ethical obligation in journalism to go out and expand that perspective. And I would add that I think some of our mischaracterization of objectivity, this idea that to be objective we have to be separate and apart, causes us problems in news organizations. It's, it's this bastardization of the concept. It keeps us remote. I mean, frankly, if I were to wave my wand and do one thing in newsrooms right now, it would be to demand that news directors and editors get out into the community and work. Because sometimes it's hard for reporters to fight those battles with editors because the reporters are out there. They are actually a little bit closer to the action. They are experiencing things. But they get, meh, that's really not going to, you know, that's not going to meet our soccer mom demographic. You know, I mean, boy, I would love to see a city editor go out and be serving lunches um, at the Catholic Multicultural Center. You get a whole different view of this community, and you get a new understanding of immigration. You, you understand the challenges of language. It's a completely different perspective than you, are, than you get sitting in your newsroom. I think that working experience is, is very important. Um, and and I, I, I don't think people aren't, a lot of people aren't necessarily um, intended to, to do something bad. Well, I think there is a lot of good intention, and unfortunately the impact isn't like that. Uh, an example, it's, um, I thought it was an okay article that, that happened in the Isthmus about uh, Young Gifted and Black last spring. Um, one of our members thought it was terrible. Um, I could see that the person writing it just didn't have um, the knowledge or experience to write about what she was trying to write about. Um, and that's kind of on the editor, um, on, on why you're having this person interview us when, when she can't put it in, into a language um, that works out. Um, I thought it was all right. She tried to go those extra steps, but it was that experience or, or that knowledge that she just didn't have to, to add that extra depth to it. Um, and it was well-intentioned. It wasn't bad, but yeah. I always advocate, all, uh, not just, I, I agree, uh, Kathleen, about going out there as editors, well, yeah, especially, please. Um, uh, but also reporters, too. A lot of reporters sit at their desk as well. Um, uh, but I, I also um, have tried really hard in, in, in my work to uh, bring people in, and, and not just the Mikes or the Matthews, who are representatives of organizations, um, but readers or people who I've written about before who I, I want to you know, show the newsroom and, and show what I do and, and, 
and um, explain how, how my job works. Um, I, I always read the comments, I always read the emails, I read all the tweets, um, I read the letters, I, I try to understand what the reaction is and what the proactive um, uh, uh, work being done to get in touch with me is um, uh, as well to, to make that connection um, so it can be uh, a two-way street in that way, even though, of, of course, there is uh, some more power in being in the media itself. One of the themes that has been touched on a lot today uh, comes up here, too, is uh, what's the role, uh, is there any room in journalism for advocacy? Um, in reporting on, especially in reporting on race and justice issues, do we have, do journalists have an ethical obligation to work for justice in the communities in which they work? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure of your response, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, Matthew dials up the sound bite. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, that's known as a softball. <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, quite, yes. Okay. I, I like, it's, 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 so, I mean, I, I get this idea of objective, but again, you know, just, I mean, it's, these are, it's, you're talking about people's humanity. Um, are you for humanity or are you against it? Are you for supporting people in their lives to live free and to have access and, and equity and, and to live free of struggle and free of poverty? Or are you against it? That, that, like I, I'm, I'm not big in black and whites and I'm talking about this in black and whites, but if you're sitting on the sideline reporting both sides as, as, as valid and, and reporting that um, somebody, I'm gonna talk more in economic lens here, but somebody is sitting and, and, and making a ton of millions and then somebody that's busting their butt working two jobs at minimum wage trying to keep their lights on, um, you know, and, and the, you know, somebody that's might be more wealthy thinks that person is lazy, just needs to work harder, but you see this person is working their butt off to keep their lights on for their kids. That's justice that that person doesn't have to do that. They don't have to struggle to survive. To survive. That we're talking about people's survivals here. This is humanity. This isn't some type of, I don't see it as a, a valid opposing viewpoint when you're talking about people's humanity. This isn't an intellectual exercise when we're talking about people's humanity. When we're talking about justice, when we're talking about what's right, it's not an intellectual exercise. Right is right. People living free of suffering is not an intellectual exercise. It's, it, it, there isn't an, uh, an opposing viewpoint that is valid, that is intellectually valid, that, that holds on to humanity. You're talking about people that are being selfish and, are, and aren't looking at people's humanity. How can you talk about that and, 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 and act like you're being objective and not talk about how horrible that is? How horrible it is when people are sitting back and watching people suffer. That is a terrible thing to be. And, and giving that credence and, and say you're trying to be objective, you're, you're supporting that lifestyle, that viewpoint, that, 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 that way of living that lets people suffer. I can't support that. That's how I feel. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I, I, um, I was trained in, yeah, as a journalist in that objective model. Um, maybe I'm one of the last generation of journalists who was, per se. Uh, but, um, but I've also worked at places where, where that model doesn't exist. Um, the Huffington Post, where I worked, we advocated very openly for many areas and positions. Um, uh, I, there's a quote by, and I'm probably going to screw it up, by Howard Zinn, which is something like, you can't be neutral on a moving train. And it's something like that, which is, which is basically what Matthew just said. Um, I mean, in my own beat right now, uh, my job is to cover race and justice. Now, like Kathleen said, we should all be covering these issues um, in various ways, but that's my title. And by existence of that title, it is an advocacy title. Um, and that's not my choice. That's the choice that my bosses make to, made to create that. They, they made this job for a reason. Uh, so it is an advocacy job. At the same time, um, I am looking to cover all people um, and, and everyone. Um, I'm not looking to exclude certain groups or organizations or races or anything, or religions from my coverage. And I, I want to uh, try to reach as far and wide as I can um, while doing justice to the job. 
So I think Sharon Dunwoody earlier was pointing to fairness as a squishy topic and objectivity as a squishy topic. And I think advocacy is a really squishy topic. With all due respect to you, Matthew, I, I, I think it is very easy to say we should advocate for all people to be free from suffering, but when you take it into specific um, coverage areas, like the coverage of, um, the, of police shootings of unarmed black men, there's a lot more complexity there than, than in your statement. And I think, um, you know, if, if I turn to Mike, he's like, oh boy, now I'm on hot seat. But if I turn to Mike, I think there's a question of whether journalism should look in and say, this is a critical issue that we have to care about. This is something that's happening in the United States, extrajudicial execution of young black men. And this is something that we need to investigate, we need to interrogate. That's different than an advocacy statement that the Madison police are racist and that's what caused this shooting. It's a, it's a, it, there are different levels. For me, I cannot understand why we don't pay more attention to mass incarceration in Wisconsin. It's, it, it, it slays me. I can't understand why that's not an issue that news organizations are saying is critically important to this state because it hits us on so many different levels. I don't see that as advocacy, saying uh, in our news judgment, this is something that the citizens of Wisconsin are affected by and, and should care about, much in the same way that the, the earlier series on teen mental health that I mentioned, it, we, we decide this matters, okay? That, I don't see that as advocacy. I see that as news judgment and representing um, properly the range of issues in society. It's different than saying, I as a, as a publisher or editor support this piece of legislation to change that or I am going to adopt this viewpoint um, on it. Those are different things. There's a difference between what what needs to be talked about in a society and how we're going to address it through different policy matters. We agree more than that. I mean, it's, it's it, uh, in my emotional thing. It's, it's, I mean, there is a lot to it. It's like, there, there is a subtle line between, you know, outright advocating um, and, you know, I, again, I take a, a large historical lens. I think police are racist based upon much of the police forces in this country started out as slave catchers. So at the root of this institution, this is what it is. Um, I look at racism as more than just, you know, bald heads and KKK. I see it as, uh, as implicit bias, as something that manifests itself in multiple different ways. So when I say somebody is racist, that's not necessarily saying you hate black people, you hate so-and-so. That's more of a way that uh, your behavior in, in reflecting of, of, of this society uh, that, that we're brought up in based upon how systems are built um, and in, in looking at, at larger contexts. On, on what's going on. Um, I don't necessarily think that is full on advocating. Um, you know, it's, it's not saying, you know, I'm supporting exactly what's going on here and I'm supporting, you know, this person and, and that group and this group and that group, but this idea of we need to take a look at what's going on here, why this is happening um, and, and what's causing, you know, this, this incarceration. Um, and we can draw lines to, you know, how, you know, Nixon started the drug war as a way of socially uh, controlling uh, black populations. That's real. That is absolutely real. And every president since then has, has supported those policies. So to, to try and say that that isn't a racist policy when it is rooted in, in, in when it started out as racist, um, you know, that's, that's, not being sincere about what's going on, even if people acting on it with their intent might not necessarily be like a full racist intent. Um, the larger context of what's going on is racist. Um, and, and to, you know, that to, I don't see that as advocacy. I just, you know, see that as, as you know, pulling out and, and, and telling the, the, the larger story, the larger context. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, there's this idea of white fragility, and I'm, I'm shifting gears a little bit. I think white people get a little too fragile when it comes to, to racism and white supremacy. They t take it as a front to themselves and individually. Um, but it's, it's a, so much larger and bigger than that, and, and, and we need to look at that, why things are going on. A mass incarceration in itself, it's racist. We have the numbers, we have the, dispar the disparities are there. It is racist. Um, and, you know, people are perpetuating what's going on. So it's, I just see this being honest about what's going on, um, opposed to advocating and saying, young, gifted, and black, you know, I support them and what they're doing. 
Um, you can tell a story without necessarily advocating on what we're trying to do. You don't have to agree everything that we, we do with. I care more about um, how people are going about it than anything. I can disagree on, on how to approach something all day long as long as we're trying to work towards the same goal. This might be a good time for some questions from the audience. Is there... Herman? Oh boy. First. Uh, how does, how do you convey uh, the issue of police discretion to staff and does media coverage ever become a fly in the ointment or an encumbrance to police discretion? Well, I would be probably naive to suggest anything to the contrary. You guys are drivers in terms of what the police response will be on some issues of our day. Um, I'm certain that that uh, when we are transparent about police discretion, I think I'm one of the only agencies in the country that literally basically decided, let's identify the elephant in the room and put an entire page on acknowledging police discretion so that it shouldn't come as a shock to the sensibilities of people who actually read the policy and understand that we understand that there's that delicate balancing what's for the best interest of the society versus the individual rights of privacy to the individual. How do we craft that sweet spot? And it, can, it has oh so many factors, as you know. But in terms of if there's some, again, some sort of sensationalism intrinsic in what we're doing at any given time, that will definitely embolden us to take different strides because we also know that there's going to be drivers from elected officials to the mayor's office to uh, constituency groups, neighborhood, and you. And you know, the, the thing is, is that uh, to the gentleman's uh, point earlier about the role, please, I really love it when the Badger Herald or Daily Cardinal, whatever the, your news student newspapers, they come on a daily basis. The one thing I don't get is that they call me at one and I'm on deadline, I gotta do this by three. <laughs> really? Okay, okay, yeah. But I, I do appreciate that your role is still noble as the fourth estate. I, I've told every reporter I've ever worked with, you know, today, Maybe you're gonna give me a, a pass because of X, Y, or Z, but I get it if tomorrow you have to be brutal with the Madison police. That is the nature of a free society. I get that, I don't resent that. You have a role to do, but the thing that I always look at is, is those days of the, the Woodward and Bernstein, that sense of nobility I'm concerned. I only can teach my, my boys two lessons I've taught. That's all I've got. I'm not very strong. Number one, people are basically good. If I don't think that every day when I put on this uniform, I'm done. And I've tried to communicate as much to my kids and to my people. The other thing is, quite frankly, if you really want to know the truth or who is speaking and why, follow the money. And I'm just so very concerned that the, the essence of purity nobility and the largesse of the role of being the fourth estate, principled and ethical, is unfortunately going to be compromised owing to the changing face of your various media portals. And I just don't know how you can counteract that short of doing your own blog, which I do a terrible job. Yeah, over here. Um, from what a lot of we've talked about, who, in your opinion, outside of organizations that you work for or have worked for, would be a, the best example at who is doing the best at handling these issues and handling it with nuance and addressing it the ways that we've talked about need to be addressed and in reporting on these issues? Who can we look to for concrete examples of who's doing this the best? Well, I think he just left for an airplane, but I would say Alan Gomez from USA Today, um, when it comes to immigration enforcement, it's not, it's not an area in which I specialize, but I know that when, um, when I read his coverage, I get some really robust, grounded, I mean, it's, he, he covers policy, but um, 
but not covering the, the, the policy itself. He covers the effects of policy, and I think you know, in the, in the um, Tampa Bay Times failure factory story, um, and in Nicole's work, I think that's what you see. You see, all right, well, we got the policy. We're not, the school board meeting has been covered. We're looking at the effects. I think Alan does a really good job in the immigration enforcement space, in that, in that particular race and justice area, does a really, really fine job. I think um, it's, you know, it's different outlets on, on different things. Um, right now, The Guardian is the only major, any kind of major source covering uh, Home and Square in Chicago. Um, and I mean, come on, we have a CIA black site, or the equivalent of a CIA black site on a major USA city uh, police department. Um, and it, it's a, basically, a UK paper is, is covering this. Um, that's, come on. <laughs> and um, I mean, I think, you know, we all know of, of one specific writer for the Atlantic. Um, but I mean, it's, I think the Atlantic at, at, at times, different individuals outside of Coke's ha have done a good job. Um, I, you know, I, I like parts of what Vice is doing um, as far as a larger kind of newer one. Um, I, I like that they give space for long form. Um, sometimes they totally miss the mark. Um, I really think a lot of outlets and most outlets, it's, it's really hit or miss. Um, and there isn't like, you know, one that I would point to. There's specific times that I can point to, to many different, different outlets. Uh, th there are a lot of people um, writing on, on various elements of, of all these issues we're discussing um, and producing radio and video and commentary and everything. Um, uh, you know, I, I have a list of uh, hundreds that I am trying to keep track of as I, as I uh, embark uh, in this area of coverage. Um, um, you know, uh, one you already know is in this room, Nicole Hannah-Jones, so she's great, a uh, wonderful reporter and writer, uh, but you guys know that because she spoke to you. <laughs> um, uh, there's um, uh, uh, one uh, former colleague of mine at MSNBC, Tremaine Lee, who's really a, a great reporter. Um, uh, at the Washington Post is Wesley Lowry. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, you look at his uh, Twitter feed and his statements, and he's definitely yeah. has an advocacy position in yeah. many areas. But then you look at his reporting, and he helped his paper win the Pulitzer Prize this year, um, doing a fantastic investigation of uh, police shootings and who was shot and, and, and why and how and when and where, because um, nobody had looked at that. Uh, at Huffington Post, there's a, there's a uh, cultural commentary writer, Zeba Blay, who I, I, I love to read. Um, uh, there, there's, there's so many, um, uh, and the list goes on, um, but uh, I, I uh, have a list on Twitter, and I will open it up publicly so you guys can see yeah. who I'm looking at. And we'll, and we'll promote that. Three more things, sorry. <laughs> to add in, I thought about while you were going. Uh, I, I read NPR's Code Switch religiously That's and find that it gives me um, fantastic perspectives. It's, it's always illuminating to me. Um, on the local level, I would really encourage you, you're gonna hear shortly, um, uh, about the Precious Lives Project, and uh, that, was a, that was just a sea change for me. I, I really have tremendous respect for that. And then, this is not a journalist, but if I, as a teacher could uh, assign a required reading for everyone. Um, it would be Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy. Uh, it's a phenomenal book that will help you understand the intersections of, um, of race and justice. It, it's tied mainly to the death penalty uh, and less to mass incarceration, but uh, many of the issues are the same and it's just uh, beautifully written too uh, and compelling and I, so. Okay. So you're my student, I assign that to you. <laughs> Two I, I, I want to add real quick is uh, Janelle from, from Slate uh, does some really good coverage. Um, and then really right now, who's been coming on strong, uh, um, um, why am I blanking on her name right now? But, but she was at first a digital editor for, for Ebony, and now it's just like the, the main editor for Ebony. But Ebony's really, um, under her um, guidance, has, I mean, just kicked a lot of ass um, <laughs> lately. I mean, just, just, just to be real, and, and just some really good coverage of, of really the diversity of, of Black America right now, and, and different things that are going on. It's it's been really cool seeing what's been going on over there lately. Uh, somebody tweeted me, "Don't forget to open your list of reporters." <laughs> um, uh, there's there's uh, if you're look, thinking about um, um, gun gun control, gun reform, gun laws, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, there's a website called the Marshall Project that is um, somewhat new that is looking deeply into these issues. Um, 
And uh, I don't know what you, you look at for your sources. You guys have taken all the good ones, but I, <laughs> I, I have a bromance with uh, Brian Stevens, so I would guess definitely go to Just Mercy. And then because I have to be topical and know where the next protest, march, or rally, I have to read Braun again, too. So I'm sure I stay on top. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this one's mostly for Jaweed, I suppose. Uh, I'm interested in the idea of a, a race and justice reporter at a newspaper. Um, it's a new concept to me. It probably has been around before, but I just didn't know about it. And the, um, the thing that I would be interested to hear from you about is how you build a beat around that and then what kind of response you've received, uh, given, as you mentioned, that there were layoffs very large ones at uh, your newspaper and across the country, and the pressure on journalists to produce uh, quick hits is directly counter to what I imagine you're trying to do. And often I imagine you're telling uh, a large portion of the core readership of your newspaper things they don't really want to hear. So what's it like? Uh, thank you for your questions. Um, well, I, I will just uh, you know preface that with that this is a new job for me. I've done it for five days now, so um, you know uh, in in my fifth day I'm, I'm an expert, as you guys can see. Um, but you know uh, the core skills of all journalism are, are very much the same. Uh, but there is obviously a lot of work to be got be done when you start in a new subject area. Um, so uh, you know, I'm I'm still kind of building it, um, doing a lot of reading. Uh, coming here has really been a wonderful experience for me, and, and maybe think a lot about how I will and can shape my coverage. Um, uh, to specifically to the uh, LA Times, um, I've gotten a wonderful reception there. I mean, they they chose to hire me, so hopefully they are nice to me, um, uh, and. Uh, it, They've told me to, you know, uh, luckily, unlike many newspapers, we still have a staff whose primary job it is to cover stories around the country and around the world. And uh, I fall in the around the country area. So um, I'm spending my time right now just thinking about what is important uh, and perhaps uncovered around the nation to, to, uh, to really tell our readers and uh, who are global now because it's all over the web too, about. Uh, so I, I welcome people's ideas, definitely. Um, and is there any part of your question that I missed? I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my past experience as a reporter, which was, has, was covering religion for nine years. And in covering religion, you cover uh, similarly um, topics that are similarly getting a very strong response from people. Um, uh, except for in religion, uh, nobody knows that they're right in the end. Um, but you, you cover immigration, you cover race, you cover politics, you cover um, crime. I, I've you know, done all these topics as a religion kind of a story, and uh, people are hateful. Um, uh, that's just how people are, but people are also wonderful. Um, I've, I've gotten a mix of both kinds of responses. Um, I found that uh, I always try to engage with people who are reading what I write or responding in some way. You know, if I get an email that's angry or a comment that it's really uh, mean and vile, I will actually find those people and call them and talk to them and try to find out you know, what their thinking is and, and where they're coming from. Um, usually it's, it's in regard, uh, the response to me, usually it's in regard to my name and my background, so it's usually an anti-Muslim kind of thing going on, uh, but that is connected in various ways to, to race and more. Um, but I, I've found it to be an enlightening experience. Um, 